So I'm breathing right down into the belly. Breathing very slowly. Pausing. Slowly releasing the breath. And then I'm feeling the physical heartbeats. I'm feeling with my hands and I'm listening internally, bringing my awareness inside. And the heartbeats act as a way to focus the awareness inside the body, to focus into the emotions. And then once we're really tuned into that, that feeling of the heart, we can practice gradually expanding and contracting the energy field with the breath. This is absolutely central to the process of sending and receiving. Focusing and listening. So it's the, the receptive and the emissive. The heart and the mind. Actually everything has that expanding and contracting quality. And there's a particular space inside a lot of shamanic practice which is to do with maintaining a type of purity of spirit, a type of um, internal stillness. The Buddhists describe this as, as equanimity. And it's that part of oneself which is deeply rooted in a type of still happiness. It's the happiness that is untouched by outer events. And it's possible to feel this happiness even in, even in the darkest, most awful times, like the death of, of someone close to you, that there's another part of you which isn't really touched. Not because you've pushed stuff aside and suppressed it, but because happiness and sadness is possible, it's possible for those things to exist simultaneously inside ourselves. And when you know that, it gives enormous freedom. It gives, gives you the freedom to really feel the terrible pain of grief, for instance, and at the same time to witness the absolute wonder of the sunset or the beauty of the sound of the rain. And all these things are present. All these things are true, all at the same time. And it's those sorts of internal spaces are very, very important in shamanic work. It's, it's why a lot of shamans spend so much time in nature. It's not only that they're connected with nature and nature spirits, it's that achieving a type of equanimity is, is very useful for their work. And also because they're tuned into a network of energy. So one of the things I've noticed in, in my practice in Nepal is that very often the shaman are working with groups of gods or groups of goddesses, like the nine Kali. And they, they, they'll come to a particular place and they tune into it. And this is like a node in a network. It's like that maybe one, uh, one place in a in Yantra or one place in a mandala. And they feel it and they send their mantra down those pathways into their environment and then they get a signal back 
which tells them that everything is okay or that, that there's a problem. And then they try and correct that problem. And so they correct the problem in the outer world by correcting the problem inside themselves first. So this, this relates to practices like Ho Hana Pono Pono from Hawaii, where the shaman cleans their response to, to a situation. And the, the internal cleaning acts in the outer world to heal the thing that's, that's out of balance. So the shaman often talk about being as, as clean as milk or as light as a feather. And this again is where certain sorts of meditation practices come into, into play. So I was once walking with a group of shaman in Sindhapajuk, quite a wild part of Nepal, and suddenly Dawa Sherpa, who is a very stocky, stocky shaman and um, doesn't talk much and he grabbed my arm he dragged me up this up through these bushes and scrambling over these rocks and he climbed much faster than me and we, we went up through this undergrowth and we came up onto this rocky rocky ridge and he he excitedly showed me this rock that looked like a tiger's head and he said I've I've sat here for many, many months. And over, over in this jungle, there's a female tiger, and she comes and watches me. And sometimes she comes very close when I'm meditating, but she didn't harm me. And later, when the earthquakes came, and Dawa lost his home, and some of the shaman were getting drunk and crying and in a terrible state, some continued their practice properly. And Dawa had a type of strange light-heartedness about it. And he, he had just built this fabulous house out of stone and it was all fallen down. And I asked about, I asked other shaman about Dawa. And they laughed and they said, Dawa doesn't care about these sorts of things. He, he doesn't care about physical objects at all. He, he's really just part of nature. And they laughed and they said, many times he just appears into the jungle or into the mountains. And Dawa had a type of equanimity because his, his focus, his real home was inside himself. Not, it wasn't dependent on these outer objects. It wasn't dependent on the security of having something. It was dependent on his internal stillness. And so... The focused awareness, the ability to act and not to hold oneself back. So you want enough self-reflection, enough clarity to be able to, to know where you're going. But you also need to be able to step continually into the unknown. And that's that's both the key to creativity and it's also the key to a lot of magical practices because you're, you're perpetually throwing yourself into the void and it's in that void that everything new comes. Thank you.